Good afternoon, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. And um, what I'm going to be talking about uh, is the future of broadband. You heard earlier from Blair Levin, who's the man from Washington, D.C., who really understands policy. I'm the guy from Silicon Valley, and uh, I'm going to talk about our view of the world, which is somewhat different. Um, I uh, work at a, a small organization uh, in Palo Alto, California, called the Institute for the Future. Um, we've been around now, I think, 46 years. We were founded in 1968, doing long-range planning and forecasting, and in fact, have worked with a number of the people uh, in this room over the years. Uh, our motto is foresight that leads to insight that leads to action. And uh, we, we see ourselves as in the business of providing the foresight, and we work with our clients to generate the insights, which hopefully will lead to the action, which is, is their responsibility. Um, as I was preparing this talk, I was thinking about one of the four founders of the Institute. It was a man named Paul Barron, uh, who passed away in 2011. Uh, he probably has as good a claim as anybody to uh, truly being the person who invented the internet, uh, probably more than uh, Vice President Al Gore. Uh, in 1964, uh, Paul published a paper for the Rand Corporation, which is where he was working, uh, called On Distributed Networks. And uh, he began by describing three kinds of network structures, uh, what he called centralized structures, decentralized, and distributed networks. And uh, the reason for this is it was actually uh, commissioned by the Air Force, who was interested in what kind of a network architecture would survive an enemy attack. And a centralized network was vulnerable because it could be taken out from a single point, but a distributed network had no center and therefore was much more robust. But it turned out that that really provided the kind of DNA that uh, really underlies the, the fundamental architecture of the internet, and as I'm going to argue, we're going to see uh, this diagram come up later on, is becoming more and more the blueprint for society in the larger sense. So what I'm going to talk about um, in the few minutes uh, that I have is, first of all, I want to talk about the power of exponential change. And I think that that's a driver that, that is, is sort of a, a challenge for us all to grasp. Then talk a little bit about the evolution of the internet, uh, the future of broadband, and then go a little bit beyond broadband to say what it all might mean, and then end up with a few suggestions that maybe help, I hope will be, uh, will be useful. Now let me start with the, 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 the question of exponential change. And human beings in general can understand linear change or incremental change. We live with that, but we really have a hard time with the concept of exponential change, although I think the Qataris probably have an advantage here because they're living in a world, of, I think, of exponential change at the moment. But where this idea really came from was uh, Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, who back in 1964 formulated Moore's Law, which is really not a, a law of nature but an observation. And what he observed is that the number of transistors per square inch on an integrated circuit had doubled every year since the integrated circuit had been invented, and he predicted that this would continue to happen in the future, so doubling every year. And in fact, that prediction has turned out to be remarkably true. So if you just look at the math of that, when you take a number and double it every year, what you get is something that looks like this. And the, those, the, those are years at the bottom. It's 1964 there on the left when he made that observation. And what's interesting is for a long time that line goes along fairly fairly level, and then it starts turning up and it goes nearly vertical, and that's where we are now. We're on that, on that upturn of the hockey stick. So we're at the point where, at least in terms of the fundamental technologies that are driving us, they're all at that point of these very large numbers. And so let's talk a little bit about what that means. So in terms of raw computing cost, what Moore's law says is that the cost of digital technology is going to keep falling. And in fact, over a 20-year period, 
From 1992 to 2012, the cost of raw computing power fell from $222 per million transistors to six cents, which is a, an improvement of 3,700%. And clearly, this enables computing power that's at the very core of the digital infrastructure to get far more powerful. And it also gets tinier and tinier. So these are the, these things that we're carrying around, I assume probably everybody in this room, carrying around these devices in our pocket have these you know, things that are beginning to approach the, the power of supercomputers. Same is true of storage. Uh, uh, over that same 20 year period, this, the, co the cost of data storage has actually fallen even more sharply from $569 for a gigabyte of data to three cents in 2012, and that's a drop of 19,000%. So st storage is getting to be almost free. Uh, and finally, bandwidth cost performance. The numbers aren't quite as dramatic, but they're in the same direction. Uh, costs fell from $1,200 roughly for 1,000 megabytes per second in 1999 to $23. And this is really what is speeding up the flow of information. So all these are big numbers. Let me give you a concrete example of, of what this means in practice. And we'll go back to 1956. And this, uh, that device that's sitting there on that forklift is the first, the world's first hard disk drive. It's the Ramac 350. It was built by IBM to accompany one of its systems. Um, it had a total, it had something like 24 separate disks in it. It had a total capacity of five megabytes. Um, you know, every time I take a picture with my, my mobile, it's more than that. Uh, the engineers in IBM, by the way, uh, said they could make a hard drive with, with 10 megabytes capacity, but the salesman said they, there was no market for it, so five megabytes was plenty. Uh, and it, at least for about $3,000 per month. So let's fast forward to 2013, and on the right is something called the Oyon Shadow Drive that you can carry around in your pocket. It weighs 5.2 ounces, which is one six thousandth of the weight of that Ramac. And if it held even the same amount of data, that'd be kind of amazing, but it has a capacity of a terabyte, which means that it holds 200,000 times more data than that RAMAC did. And finally, the Oyon Drive, you can go on amazon.com right now and buy it for $89.95, unless this is on, you know, it's on sale now, it might be less. Uh, so the cost of storage on one of these drives is about six cents per gigabyte. Uh, or, you know, a t tiny fraction of one cent per megabyte. So storage, almost free. Give you one other quick, ex one, more, one more example. Uh, in 1994, uh, Apple computer, when they're often trying to push the envelope, uh, they uh, 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 released one of the world's first digital cameras. It was called the Quick Take. Um, it had a resolution of uh, 0.3 megapixels. Uh, it could store a total of eight four photos. Uh, it had uh, no focus, no zoom. There was no way to preview any of the pictures. Uh, you had to download it to your, your computer and then look at them. And I, I managed to borrow one of these. I was a fairly serious photographer, and I was interested in this idea of a digital camera. So I borrowed one, went around and took some pictures, and I downloaded it to my computer. And they were terrible. They really sucked, to use the technical term. Um, and I went around predicting to all of my friends that uh, digital photography will never replace film. Wrong. I don't think there's any film cameras here today. Uh, so here we are in 2013. This is the uh, Sony RX100. It has 20 million pixels. It has a 28 to 100 millimeter zoom lens. It has an LCD screen with a million bytes in it. Uh, an ISO rating that goes up to 6400 and it also does video, it does panoramas and you know here it is right here and of course this is an obsolete technology also this because nobody really wants a separate camera you know it's disappearing inside of our, our mobile phones and not only you know will they be soon better than this camera but it's connected to the world so I've already like this morning taken a couple of pictures of this audience and sent it back to my kids in California so they're following this event in real time so that's an example of the way in which technology in a very short period of time can start doing things that a few years earlier had seemed impossible so now let's talk about oh now those are the examples of the pictures that you can take you know sort of on the left that's what the Apple took and on the right, that's actually a, a zoom, just a small part of one of those pictures. And I promise that's the last picture you'll see of my grandkids. 
Um, but I wanted to bring them here. So let's, now let's talk about the evolution of the internet. So here we are in 1969. This is the full extent of the internet. Uh, it's the first deployment of what then actually was known as ARPANET. There were four nodes, one at Los Angeles, one at the Augmentation Research Center at Stanford Research Institute, headed by Doug Engelbart, one of the sort of secret heroes of the information age, one in Santa Barbara, and one at the uh, University of Utah. Uh, they were all interconnected with modems on leased lines that ran at the, the uh, breathtaking speed of 50 kilobits per second. Uh, and there were, I don't know, you know, 100 people who are on the internet. And here we are today. Uh, you, I mean, I can't show a map that shows all of the connections, but this is a kind of a heat map. This is actually going over a 24-hour period, and the redder the, the colors are, the more intense the use is. And it, it, it's, a, it's a daily pattern. And you can see that wherever there are people and electricity, there is now internet activity. And you know, certainly the northern tier of the world is you know, ex extremely hot. Uh, India and China are coming along. You know, uh, Africa is still in development, but you know that's where the next billion or two billion people are likely to come from. So you know, and that's that's an you know the end. This went from this tiny little thing to taking over the whole world. Um, but another example of how rapidly this world is changing, and, and it's not just people, but it's the things that the internet can do. And just go back, just think about going back to January of 2006. So at that point, Facebook was only on college campuses. There was no, no, no none of us had access to it unless we were a student in college. Um, Twitter didn't exist yet. Uh, it was created in March of 2006, and it was launched in July of that year. So nobody had ever heard of Twitter, which is running over there. Uh, in 2006, Netflix was the largest single customer for first-class mail delivery of the U.S. Post Office. They, in that year, they had mailed their billionth DVD. Uh, by 2010, they had become the biggest source of internet traffic in North America in the evening as they moved to streaming service. So that entire business model had shifted. Uh, there was no iPhone in 2006. Uh, nobody had ever seen that kind of uh, a device before. It was released in 2007, and um, Android didn't come along till uh, 2008. And so the, the smartphone was just really not something, you know, the BlackBerry was about the, as far as the technology went. Uh, nobody had ever heard of a MOOC in 2006. Uh, Coursera, which was the thing that grew out of the Stanford course that had 160,000 people online, was launched in 2012, and it was it was been joined quickly by many others. And finally, in 2006, clouds were just something you saw in the sky. Uh, Amazon Web Services was introduced at the very end of 2006, and now serves over 100,000 companies in 190 countries, and really start, helped us to uh, spark the whole movement of cloud. And I think I've seen data that says now half of the world's computing is now taking place in the cloud. So, okay, that's the story of change. So now let's talk a little bit about the future um, and what it might hold. And, it's, and given my scenario, what I'm saying is it's really very hard to know what the future will hold. It's, it's going to be full of surprises, but there are some places, as Blair said, there are some places where the future has already arrived. We can look at those. And one of them is in the scientific research world. Uh, the uh, National Lambda Rail in the U.S. is an ultra-high performance network that supports advanced research activities at hundreds of universities and research la laboratories across the U.S. It's currently offering connections at 40 gigabits per second, and they're working on uh, moving up to 100 gigabits for, per second shortly. And uh, what drives it is what they call application-empowered, high-performance e-science projects, high-energy physics, astronomy, earth science, bioinformatics, and environmental sciences. And what they believe is that in the coming decade, e-science is going to require terabit networks, exabyte storage to, this, to support distributed peta-ops computing. So these, you know, these notions of terabits and exabytes and peta-ops, it's like a whole new language. You know, I think we've already learned about, you know, we've moved from megabytes to gigabytes to terabytes, but now, you know, these, these next increments, and every one is an increment of a thousand. 
And I think uh, Robert Pepper probably will talk about some of these numbers and what they mean uh, this afternoon. So what is, what's going on there? One of the most spectacular uses of the Lambda Rail is an, a, a multi-gigabit um, network known as SAGE, the Scalable Adaptive Graphic Environment, which makes it possible to create wall-sized displays of scientific data by tiling arrays of large video monitors that permit users to visualize and interact directly in real time with data in many novel ways. And this is currently being used for scientific research, but I believe that versions of these versatile displays will eventually be found in businesses and homes. And uh, Dr. Pepper told me, oh, if I come down to visit uh, Cisco in Santa Clara, he can show me a commercial prototype that they've already got running, which is a great example of the future usually arrives faster than we expect that it will. Uh, another interesting use of uh, Lambda Rail is Cinegrid which provides ultra-high speed connections that support digital media exchanges among remote participants. So, for example, you could have a worldwide crew who are editing a movie together in real time with zero lag, um, an example of what Blair would call high-performance collaboration that can be done seamlessly over the network. Uh, so that's the national Lambda Rail in the U.S., but there's a bigger picture, which is the global Lambda integrated facility, GLIF, which spans the world. And it provides a network that makes it possible for scientists around the world to get rapid access to vast amounts of data, for example, from the Large Hadron Collider, which sits in Switzerland and generates enormous amounts of data, uh, but that can be transported over, over something like, like this network. Uh, the, the participants in the GLIF are the National Research and Education Networks, NRENs, and I noticed that part of the uh, broadband plan for Qatar calls for the establishment of a national research and education network in Qatar. And so that means that you will be connected to this global facility. Uh, another development that we can see that's going to change the nature of networking in the near future is what's known as software-defined networks. Uh, OpenFlow is a standard for software defined networks that allows the path of packets through the network to be determined not by hardware, but by software that runs on multiple routers. And so what this means is that we're gonna move from a static, essentially one size fits all internet to a more flexible architecture that's controllable by the users themselves to optimize advanced application. And this is gonna increase flexibility tremendously, uh, but it also can raise the specter of network fragmentation and uh, even balkanization if everybody is running their own network. Uh, this, by the way, is the architecture that sits inside many of the largest data centers. Google's internal data centers are entirely run on this kind of architecture. But up till now, the public-facing uh, networks are different. Let's go a couple of more examples of the things that, that, that are appearing and that I think suggest where the future is going. Uh, Innocentive has been described as the eBay for innovation. It's an open platform where companies who have problems that they're struggling to survive can post what they call challenges and invite anybody in the world to offer a solution in exchange for cash rewards. And uh, they've had you know, thousands of problems posted and thousands of problems solved. And the, the basic premise is no matter how many smart people you may have working for your organization or your company, there are more smart people in the world at large. And Innocentive gives you access to them all. Uh, another example that I really like, a brand new company that's in, in Palo Alto, California, is Declara, which is a, a, a kind of a, a smart social network for organizations that uses machine learning to understand what the capability of the, the participants are of the network and then matching them up together. Uh, the first deployment is among the 280,000 uh, uh, K-12 teachers in Australia that are giving them a platform to share best practices and ideas. And so instead of each stu uh, teacher in a classroom kind of working on their own, now they'll have access to all of the best experts in, uh, in their, their country. And you know, there's no reason why something like that won't go global. And finally, uh, uh, two weeks ago, IBM announced that Watson, which is the system that they created that went on uh, the quiz show Jeopardy and beat the two human challengers uh, a couple of years ago, kind of a very elaborate stunt, but they've now broadened its capabilities and they announced two weeks ago it's going to be online 
and anybody can sign up to use this. So instead of thinking of a computer as something that you, you, know, you program essentially at a low level or a high level, you'll be able to go in, you'll ask questions, and Watson will answer it. And you know, the, 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 the people there are suggesting that this is changing the paradigm with which we're going to interact with computers. So again, models for change that really each one can radically change. But that's not all. There's a few more. Uh, Google Glass. Uh, I, you know, there are already lots of people walking around my area out in Silicon Valley who are wearing these things uh, that are, and I've tried it on, it's a little bit strange, but you know, you, you, you're bringing the internet with you. you, you talk to it or you touch it briefly, it's on your eyeglasses and it'll give you the answer to any question. And again, this is just generation point zero. You know, you think about like 2022, the people who are going to be coming to the World Cup, many of them are going to be wearing the great-great-grandson of this device. So it's not just going to be a better phone in their pocket, it's going to be incredibly powerful devices that they're going to be wearing. And what their expectations are for the kind of connectivity they want may be sort of a surprise. You know, one of the things that you're going to be doing is augmented reality. You'll be able to overlay the real world with data. Um, and in fact, one of my colleagues at Institute for the Future says, we'll look back on this era where we walked around in ordinary reality as sort of quaint and outmoded in a, f in a few years. We'll just simply expect the data to be there. And I think it's very interesting that Qatar is essentially scanning in 3D the entire country and will have the geocoded data above ground and below ground that will give you the ability to do this kind of uh, virtual reality uh, very easily. Uh, driverless cars are coming. Uh, I was in a parking lot in a little shopping center next to my house uh, a few weeks ago, and there was a guy from Google uh, taking a smoking break outside his Google car, and he just sp spends the whole day kind of running around the, uh, on, on the freeways uh, getting experience. And I asked him, I said, did he keep his hands on the wheel at all? And he said, near them, near the wheel. And I asked him, was he ever scared? And he said, only by other drivers. So it's, it's working quite well. And I think within a decade, that's going to be real. Uh, robots are starting to arrive. This is a little, a, little, a little device that sells for under $200 called Autumn. It's a little assistant that uh, it provides support for people who are dieting for weight loss. So it's very friendly, very simple. But of course, the power comes from its, its connection. And uh, uh, the news just came out last week that Google is making a very, very large investment in robots that I think is going to be interesting to watch. They haven't said really much about what they're doing other than they're doing it. Uh, one week ago, Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, uh, was on television in the States, and he announced that uh, one of the things that Amazon is playing with are uh, pilotless drones because he wants to be able to uh, fulfill an order within 30 minutes. So you'll, you'll, you'll order something, and uh, within a few minutes, this drone will arrive in your backyard and deliver, deliver the package. Uh, and finally, um, as I arrived in the airport here, I saw this poster from HSBC that has this campaign about the future. And it says, um, in the future, exports will not be tr uh, transported, they'll be transmitted. And at first, I had no idea what that meant, but it sounded pretty futuristic. And then uh, Dr. Pepper told me, well, what they're talking about is 3D printing. In other words, if you want to get a part delivered, you don't have to send the physical part. You just will send the blueprint for the part, and a local 3D printer will print it out. And what's interesting about all of these applications is that this is taking the internet and now moving it out into the world in kind of autonomous form. So one of, one of the things I think is really happening now is that the internet is, is, is rapidly transforming from a place, a sort of a separate place, cyberspace, that we would go visit for specific purposes to something that's just simply part of our everyday environment, that's going to be in objects, that's going to be uh, projected into the world. So it's going to be a constant companion for us. So now let's move beyond broadband. So given all of this marvelous technology, what does it mean for society. And this is really, I think, the most critical element. Uh, I would argue that we're now in the process of moving from a connected world, which is what we're talking about here, to what I would call a hyper-connected world. And what are the implications of that? Well, one of them is uh, my colleague from the Institute for the Future, uh, Marina Gorbis, has written a book called The Nature of the Future, when she talks about what she calls a social-structed world by this, she means that 
individuals or small groups are able to harness the power of technology to join together in new ways and provide an, an array of new products and new services in ways that were simply impossible. Um, I think this, the Khan Academy is a great example of that. One man with a video camera and a pen who was trying to teach uh, some math problems to his niece a few states away ended up creating a global resource now that's changing the nature of, of education everywhere. Uh, and these new kinds of enterprises Again, what we're seeing is this, the, the, these diagrams, which we saw 50 years ago uh, from uh, Paul Barron, now really representing the way in which individuals relate and in which structures are created. Another example, uh, another group that's studying this new world that's being created by broadband internet is called the Deloitte Center for the Edge, again, located in Silicon Valley. It's headed by John Hagel and John Seeley Brown. Uh, the former director of Xerox Park, and one of their most recent studies looks at how exponential change in technology leads to what they call exponential innovation. They also have talked about something they call the big shift. And if I'm going to show you a picture, and if you walk away with anything from my talk, I think this picture is probably the most important. And it's pretty simple. Uh, it's the shift from stocks to flows of knowledge. So if we think about the 20th century, you know, this was a world, this was the knowledge century where we would accumulate and we would build up stocks of knowledge and then we would be able to exploit them. Think of patent portfolios, think about companies with great uh, intellectual property, companies that have reached economies of scale and been able to turn out and mass produce goods to the world. But in a world of constant and accelerating change, those stocks of knowledge decay so rapidly that they, you, can't, you can't exploit them over time. Uh, in certain fields, in technical fields in school, students who are in college for four years, by the time they graduate, half of what they learn may be obsolete. And so there's no choice but to engage in a world of continued learning. So we have to move, they would argue, from a world of scalable efficiencies, the path to success in the 20th century, to pursue scalable learning which enables everyone to become better, faster, by actively participating in networks, both internal and external, and have opportunities to take on and, and deal with really challenging problems. Uh, so that innovation, which we think about in the world of products and services, is great, but we also need innovation in our institutions to evolve, to work in this new world. And I'll just give you a couple of quick examples of what I mean by this transition from stocks to flows. Consider Encyclopedia Britannica. It's great work of, uh, of, of the accumulation of man's knowledge, first published in 1768, published continuously until nine, uh, 2012, when the company that uh, published it announced that was the last print edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And why? Well, it was something called Wikipedia that came along, a uh, crowdsourced online encyclopedia that turns out that people kind of look down on until they realized it's much larger, it's much more up to date, and even more importantly, totally transparent because on every page, you not only get the information, but there's a tab up on the top called Talk. And if you click on that tab, you see all of the discussions that go into the making of that entry, so that you're not only given the information, you're given the story that, that's behind it. Uh, another example of moving from stocks to flows. You know, education used to be something that happened inside a school, and that happens to be the high school in Denver, Colorado, where I uh, got my high school education. And uh, it was a great place, um, but you know, today, education no longer is confined to the walls of a school. Uh, we are now creating what John Seely Brown calls learning networks with an infrastructure that can unite not only the schools, but uh, museums, uh, after school programs, homes, and uh, online resources. And the schools just really become one, one more node in a learner's learning network. And it's really the learner, him or herself, who can be at the center of their own education and pursue what, whatever interests them and takes them on. One last example, you know, uh, uh, it's 
great uh, institution of our newspapers, which packaged the world up and would deliver it to us every 24 hours, now is seeming increasingly anachronistic. You know, we have 24-hour news, you know, CNN, Al, Al Jazeera, but you know, increasingly we have Twitter feeds so that you don't need the newspaper at all. You're getting direct reports from the, from the world, from the people who are participating in it. So we're you know, moving again from stocks of knowledge to flows, and so the issue is really one of participation. So that's the, the opportunity. The here's the challenge, though. You know, technological change is exponential and is happening very fast, but social change, business change, and particularly political change happen more slowly. And this is, I think, the, this phenomenon accounts for the reason that Blair explained that the most important sentence in the national broadband plan that he created is that the plan is in beta and always will be because it's going to have to keep changing. So let me end up with a few suggestions I hope will be useful to you. A couple of things that I think it would be good to do, some things maybe not to do. Uh, one of the things not to do is what the U.S. just tried to do with healthcare.gov. I don't know if this disaster has made its way around the world, but it's been an enormous embarrassment for millions of people. And, and I, I happen to think that the product they're offering is absolutely in, uh, incredibly important and valuable. I mean, to extend healthcare coverage to millions of people. It's the U.S. being one of the few countries that doesn't uh, provide this for everybody. But the implementation is, uh, as Blair said, got... Uh, messed up royally, and uh, you know, an example of trying to use very old 20th century, if not 19th century processes to, uh, to build something that was a disaster. You know, a better example, one that I really like, is something called the Direct Project that was also done by the federal government. Um, for over a decade, the government has been pursuing something called the National Health Information Network, NHIN, which is a vast, very elaborate, very uh, ambitious infrastructure to, to connect all the healthcare systems. And they've progressed very slowly. Um, and um, the only reason you haven't heard about it is because there was no mandate for it to ever have a deadline. But in 2010, a small group of entrepreneurs, both inside and outside of government, decided they were going to try a different approach. Uh, rather than trying to develop a set of specifications, issue a contract, and then uh, run the contract, what they did was to um, set some very high-level goals, set up a public wiki, and then invite anybody who wanted to participate to come in and help them design the product. And um, within less than a year, they had, they had attracted, first of all, about 65 major uh, players in the U.S. to take, take part. Within less than a year, the project moved from a discussion of goals, the creation and testing of a prototype to its initial rollout, and now it's being taken up uh, as very uh, limited, modest goals, but it's been a tremendous success, and it was an example of how government can function on entrepreneurially. Another example, I think, of what to do is um, in Mexico City, uh, 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 earlier this year, they set up something called the Laboratorio para la, la Ciudad, or the Laboratory for the City. Uh, it's an experimental program whose goal is to foster civic innovation and urban creativity. Uh, for example, they partnered with Code for America, which is a, a, a program to recruit young people uh, to help governments to create Code for Mexico City. When they, they asked for proposals to solve city problems, they got applications from some 250 young people uh, who wanted to work for city government, and now they put them in a room and they're working uh, on all kinds of interesting applications. Another example, good thing to do, uh, a Google Fiber uh, a couple of years ago went to Kansas City and said they were going to wire up the whole city with gigabit speed fiber, which is great. And then the city responded by saying that this was a wonderful gift, but that they needed to do strategic thinking uh, among the citizens to figure out how to make use of it. Another great example of what to do, this is one of my favorite places in New York City. It's a storefront in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan called Senior Planet, and it's a showcase for cutting edge technology for senior citizens. And so seniors are invited in to play with the technology. They can take workshops and classes in the back room, and every time they have a sign up for classes, there's a line that goes out the door. And a final example, if you, you know, you're trying to cultivate innovation in Qatar, you know, it's very appealing to think of it as, like agriculture. You know, you prepare the soil, you plant the seeds, you till the ground, you fertilize it, and, you know, the wonderful crops will come up. Uh, but that's really not how innovation happens. It doesn't really work that way. 
Uh, there's really another model, and it looks more like this. It's uh, uh, two young entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley have argued that it's really like a rainforest, uh, not a farm. It's disorderly. It's teeming with all sorts of life. It's very hard to tell the weeds from the seeds. Um, but, but, you know, when Facebook started, it didn't look any more promising than any other of a thousand startups which, which didn't go anywhere. So, you know, if you want to really cultivate innovation, you have to do things like create a culture that will support it. There's a long conversation about what that involves, uh, but that's a, that's a discussion for another time. Let me just end with a final thought. So, two very different views of the future. And the first, um, the first view comes from that great American philosopher Garfield the Cat, who is the hero of a comic strip. And Garfield's a rather sedentary, um, uh, pleasure-loving uh, character, but he has a lot of interesting thoughts. So in this strip, uh, his, his owner uh, named John is uh, looking at Garfield, who's in a characteristic pose, and he's saying to him, Garfield, you know, we can't do anything about the past. But then he says, we can do something about the future. And Garfield lies there and he thinks, sounds like a lot of effort to me. He says, I think I, I'm going to like the future just the way it's going to be. So, you know, if that's your view, life is simple. On the other hand, there's another philosophy that I like better that has been attributed to Peter Drucker, and that is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I think, uh, you know, Qatar has a wonderful opportunity now to invent its future. And so I want to wish you uh, fair winds and calm seas and a wonderful future as you move into it. Thank you.